Hello, everyone. It is good to see you back here for Bible study again this week. I am joined again by my friend and colleague, Lisa Bryant from, um, from Madam Russell up in Virginia, United Methodist Church. And I'm Adam Love. I'm the pastor at Mayfair United Methodist Church here in Kingsport. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much that uh, you are speaking to us through your word. As we, as we break open um, your word, may we find the living word in the midst of the written word, who is Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 And hi, everybody. Like Adam said, I'm Lisa Bryant from Adam Russell in Saltville, Virginia. And we're going to be talking today, we're can kind of continuing on in Acts. Um, we're going to be talking kind of about uh, chapter 10 and, and going forth. Um, we've talked about how Luke was Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem. And then Acts, Luke, Luke writes about the journey outward from Jerusalem. So we're kind of, we're, we're journeying here with, with the disciples. And um, here we are with Peter. So I'm actually going to pick up and read the very last verse of chapter 9, that's 943, and then I'm going to start in chapter 10 of Acts. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa, Peter, stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called, he was a devout man who feared God with all his household, he gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel spoke to him, when the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. We'll stop yep. right in I'm there. Reminded, I'm reminded there, Lisa, of Luke chapter seven. And uh, if you if you flip back really fast, I just thought of this to Luke seven, and I think this is also in Matthew's gospel as well. Um, Jesus meets the centurion, and he says, um, "Where is it, Luke?" Hold up right here. The beginning of chapter seven, isn't it? Seven, yeah, it's the beginning, seven, nine. Um, when Jesus heard these words, this is from the centurion who's asking Jesus um, to heal his servant, right? Mm -hmm. um, when Jesus heard these words, he was impressed with the centurion. He turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. And that story is repeated in a different way or, or a different story, but the same thing in Matthew's gospel. We have this uh, Roman occupier, what we would say, of, of, of Israel, um, but somehow faith is being found in those people. And in this one, um, the, my translation says Gentile in verse this, I'm back in Acts now, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, verse 2 a Gentile God worshiper. I think Lisa's reading from the NRSV, if I'm not mistaken. And what does it call? It calls him what? He was a devout man who feared God with all his house, with all his household. I think we mentioned here um, in the past few weeks somewhere that there were these people who Paul would find along the way, right? And they, they were, we, it, it's been translated, uh, they were God fearers or God worshipers. And Paul loved to find these people because he could go wherever he was, whether it was, you know, Ephesus or, or here at uh, Caesarea of uh, uh, Philippi or, or Maritime, which is, just means the seizure of city by the ocean, wherever he was in the known world or the, his known world, there was more of the world that, than that, um, 
he would go to the synagogue service. He would find these people who were interested in the God of the Jews, who would be there kind of on the periphery, who weren't Jewish, but yet were interested in it. And then this was kind of a natural way for him to share the gospel. Right. Let me tell you the rest of the story of the God of Israel, right? Kind of a bridge because these, um, these people had already known God, the mm -hmm. one true God. And you mentioned that that parallel, and Luke does that a lot in in uh, his gospel, and then in Acts, he parallels Jesus' journey within the disciples' journey and the the stories. Because in chapter seven, as well, right before that, when we get the story of the raising of Tabitha, mm -hmm. um, that that was in Acts. I'm now I'm confusing myself. It's not hard to do. Yeah, it's not, yeah, but yeah, but I think what you're saying is the raising of Tabitha, but also correlates with the raising of the widow. Yeah, yeah. In chapter seven, right after that. So yeah, yeah, it kind yeah. Of, it, Luke does that often. He parallels those stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting to me in this part that I read here that how um, you know Peter. So after he raises um, Tabitha from the dead. It becomes known throughout the land of Joppa and he has many followers. And then he stays in Joppa for some time with this man named Simon, who was a tanner. Mm -hmm. And a tanner is a person who um, skins the leather off of dead animals. Which, what does that mean for a, for a devout Jew? Yeah. Adam, that means it, they're unclean, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, Simon the Tanner is going to be part of the great unwashed world. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's kind of, you know, not only does, as Lisa said, not only does Luke parallel the stories between Luke and Acts, like, so the church, the disciples are following Jesus and Luke, and now the disciples are still following Jesus, but it's just the Holy Spirit into the world. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's, he, Luke does these, these kind of, he paints a picture with his stories. And so it's not just that uh, Peter is staying in Joppa or he's, you know, going to now meet Cornelius from Caesarea Maritime. It's that, it's this kind of picture, it's kind of Rembrandt-esque. There's this picture of him staying with the tanner but what it really represents is he's staying with the great unwashed horde called Gentiles, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So Peter is both feet in the Gentile world, right? So it would seem he's going there, isn't he? Yeah. 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 He's heading there. Okay. Okay. He is heading there. Um, so it well, is let me pick up after that. And then we'll keep going and we'll go back and forth. Um, so Lisa ended her reading at verse 8 of chapter 10 in Acts. So Acts 10, 9, we'll pick up there. So uh, Cornelius the centurion has had an encounter and he's going to go find Peter. At noon the following day, as their journey brought them close to the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted to eat. While others were preparing the meal, he had a visionary experience, or maybe your translation says a dream or a deep sleep, right? He saw heaven opened and something like a large linen sheet being lowered to, to earth by its four corners. Inside the sheep were all kinds of four-legged animals, reptiles, and wild birds. A voice told him, just as a voice told Cornelius, a voice tells Peter, get up. Peter, kill and eat. Peter exclaimed, absolutely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke a second time. Never consider unclean what God has made pure. This happened three times. Then the object was suddenly pulled back into heaven. Peter was bewildered about the meaning of this vision. Just then, the messenger sent by Cornelius discovered the whereabouts of Simon's house and arrived at the gate. Calling out, they inquired whether Simon, known as Peter, 
was a guest there. While Peter, I love this, this, I'm, I'm so like, I love the Common English Bible for its ease of use. Um, but I just can tell when the translator was like, this word is too good to take out. And so they leave in like this really one good poetic word. So chapter 19, while Peter was brooding over the vision, the spirit interrupted him. Look, three people are looking for you. Go downstairs. Don't ask questions. Just go with them because I have sent them. This, I was, Lisa and I were talking before we started today. Like this is one of these stories that just haunts me. And because there's so much here and we'll get into that in a minute, but I, I just, I'm going to shut up and let Lisa talk, but I want to, I'm going to ask her this and hopefully this will give us a good way to, to talk about these verses. Um, one, there's this theme in Peter's life with three times, right? Yes. You know, denying Jesus three times, Jesus asking Peter if he loves him three times, and now this. And of course, it's not in Luke where we get the reconciliation of Peter and Jesus. That's in John. John talks about, you know, Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? But it, here it is in Luke. Again, this theme with Peter with three times. Um, but God tells Peter something. And Peter says, no, thanks, God. I'm a good Jew. I'm not going to touch that. I can do it. So, like, Lisa, how many times, like, could, could, could you write a book about how many times either you yourself or well-meaning church members have knowingly or unknowingly basically said no to Jesus because the Bible told them so? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've done it myself. Yeah. So many times. I and really said, no, thank you, God. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. 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 Peter is, mm -hmm. Peter's a Jew. Peter knows what he's talking about. Peter knows what's clean and what's unclean. I've never had anything unclean. So we can, we just know from these words that Peter is a lifelong, Jew. he was born a Jew and practiced Judaism. He is a Torah observer. Cannot go there. Right. What, how in the world do you react when the God of Torah tells you to break Torah? Tells you, right. So, so that is totally ingrained in who he is. He's lived his life knowing yep. that he cannot eat these things. Yep. His yep. mama, his daddy, his aunts and uncles, they didn't eat it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not only did they not eat it, they recited the verses, the law throughout the year. I mean, and reinforced that God has given us the gift of covenant and the way we live into it is through the law. Yeah. Which was the law was also a gift from God that enabled the people to live in the covenant. So, right. Yeah. I mean, okay. So then I want to, I want to point this part out. Um, that word brooding, I think, is just one of the greatest words in the English language. I love to brood. I can be a moody, kind of grumpy guy sometimes. I know you're surprised, but it's the truth. And uh, ask my wife. She's seen me do it. And um, But the word brood is to sit with a problem. And in some translations, um, in the beginning, in the very beginning, in Genesis, the beginning, God's spirit, you recall, it says, a lot of translations say hovers over the waters because the waters represent chaos, the unknown, right? And God is going to call order out of chaos. But in some versions, very poetic and very appropriate, it's not that God's spirit hovered above the waters. It's that God's spirit brooded above the waters are brooded upon the waters. In other words, there's this problem and God's going to solve it. And what does God do? God calls order out of the chaos and begins creation. What's Peter doing? <laughs> he's, 
He's brooding. How do I make sense of this? How do I, how do I live into the God who calls order out of chaos when God's telling me to break the law? Break the law. Yep. Anyway, I've gone on about that long enough. Thanks for putting up with me. So God is kind of um, redirecting Peter to new places. We see this kind of, and Luke um, gives us this progression of, of, of things uh, that Peter, taking Peter to a new, new places that, and, and places he wouldn't normally go. Um, just the fact that he stayed with Simon, a tanner. Um, and then when we uh, keep reading, um, we will see that he goes to Cornelius mm -hmm. and stays at his mm -hmm. house. So I'll just go ahead and keep reading. Yeah, please. All right. And Verse 21 is where you're picking up. Okay, yeah. So Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet worshiped him. But Peter made him get up saying, stand up. I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? So Peter recognizes that yeah. God yeah. is turning him in a new direction. Yeah. It's and 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 Peter should be used to this too, because being led in a new direction, being being shown new things is exactly what, you know, here's Peter, one of the first disciples called. And He's followed Jesus, you know, even if we just take Luke and Acts, we don't worry about the other gospels, just Luke and Acts. He's followed Jesus around Galilee for a long time. He went through Samaria to Jerusalem. And now Jesus is leading him again. It's just the resurrected Jesus and it's the spirit leading him. Right. Right. So right. what's Peter learning? Peter's learning that the, the, our primary, I was talking, we had early, we had youth service at the, what we call big church at 11 o'clock today. And then uh, we're still doing a little bit of outdoor worship at 930, just for those who want to come and be outside. And we talked about um, Ananias and Paul, which was just before this story. And so the courage, not only did it take for Paul <clears throat> to to, you know, to, to be converted, to have the scales fall from his eyes. But for Ananias, this new Christian or this follower of the way, a Jew who believed in the Messiahship of Jesus, um, to reach out and touch Paul and trust God. And now here's Peter and Cornelius, these two opposite people being brought together, these stories of you know, you've got Paul and Ananias, Cornelius and Peter, um, the, the Ethiopian eunuch and um, um, Philip. Yeah. Um, even, even, I mean, we could say the story of, of Stephen and the, uh, the council, even though he gets stoned to death, it's still God bringing these people together. Doesn't always end well, but 
It's obedience. Mm -hmm. It's obedience. You no longer have the law. You have a savior. And if you have a savior who's alive, obedience. Obedience. Yeah. Am I right? I think. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we see kind of a transformation in, in Peter's life, mm -hmm. um, you know, as well. And you mentioned this, I think, earlier before we started recording. It's kind of a continual conversion, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know. And Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's salvation is not a one-time thing. Right. We talked, I think we talked about this. We, talked about that. we have yeah. been saved. We are being saved and we will be saved. Right. And, and it's a, it's an ongoing process. If and we're going to be, go ahead. I'm sorry. If we're going to be downright Wesleyan about it, it's new birth and justification. Mm -hmm. And those two, you know, justification, what we would say, you know, in the South, getting saved that happens in a moment, in an instant. But the other side of the coin is new birth. And that lasts a lifetime. And being two sides of one coin, you can't prime apart with a crowbar, can you? So I'm still being saved. Thank God. And, and what Peter is, and, and, I'm, and I'm in good company because here's the cornerstone of the church, the apostle Peter, still being converted years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, That's maybe what I was thinking. That, know exactly how long it is, but it's, it continues. Yeah, we, we are, um, this, this, the, the, I mean, I think for myself anyway, I continually am surprised and amazed at what God does and, and you know, tend to, yeah, argue with God sometimes about, no, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, we're in good company. I mean, that continual um, reminder that we need, have got to be open to what God can do and he can do anything right. he wants to do. And we have got to be, he can call us to anywhere he wants to call us. Um, yeah. Even the uncomfortable places, the places we normally wouldn't go. In fact, you might even say it's a guarantee. That's and where he's going to call you. Does. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. You, somewhere along the way, um, my Ananias is going to meet Paul somewhere. And, and Jesus is going to say, lay hands on that guy. Or Cornelius is going to show up in my church and say, you're not going to believe this, but God's at work in my life. And I'm going to think, that is not how God works. Get out of here. But lo and behold, come meet my family. Come over here tonight. You meet my family. Yeah. Meet me. I mean, oh God, what a, yeah. Well, Lisa, will you close us in prayer? I sure will. Thanks. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time we have together to dig deeper into your word and that you are an amazing God and continue to amaze us, to surprise us to bring us to new places. Help us to keep our minds and our hearts open to follow you no matter where you take us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, guys. Bye.